Welcome to Clearview Church Online. My name is Donovan, this is Sarah, and we are the lead pastors here at Clearview Church. We are so glad that you've chosen to join our online service. If you're in the greater Cleveland area, we'd love to have you in person. We are at the, located at the corner of Boone and 82 in Columbia Station. Now as we get ready for service, stand on your feet, prepare your heart and your mind to worship Jesus as we pray ourselves into worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship and gathering in your word. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts exactly where we're at in the season of life that we're walking through. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Darkness tries to roll over my boats. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I Brokenness and pain is all I know. And I won't be shaken. And I won't be shaken. And my fear doesn't stand. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide. But I am not a captive to the lies. Oh, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. His name is 
Jesus because I'm a storyteller. I told you about my imagination world. We've all been welcomed into the world of flying Swedish fish and other fun things that happen in my mind on a regular basis. But here's the thing about the parables. It's not a pair of bowls like two bowls of cereal because you never only eat one bowl of cereal. Let's just all be honest right here. Like confession time. Nobody eats one bowl of cereal. You eat cereal and then you add cereal to finish the milk. You've eaten two bowls of cereal. We're not talking about parables. We're talking about parables. And the parables, Jesus did this incredible thing in the Bible where he took familiar truths to teach unfamiliar things. So he spoke, he was rabbi, and because he was rabbi, his, his disciples referred to him and called him a rabbi out of honor and respect. He was a teacher. But the thing about Jesus was he taught more than content. He taught things bigger than what anybody had ever understood up until that moment. Every one of his, every one of his parables all taught the same principle. And it was about the kingdom of heaven. Because up until that point, the understanding of the kingdom of heaven, the understanding of how to get to heaven had been very religious driven, had been, been very rule driven, and quite, to be honest, unattainable by people. And so Jesus came in and he said, one, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But now I'm not only going to show you that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to be the way, the truth, and the life. But I'm also going to explain what it is that I'm the way to and why you want to be there. So Jesus took this, this opportunity continuously to teach in things that people understood. Here's one of the reasons, only one. And I, they're really not numerically listed because if I had to list, list all the reasons I love the Bible, we'd be here until Christmas. I'm telling you, and I lost count a long time ago, but one of the reasons that I love the Bible is because of the parables. Most of Jesus' parables are in relation to farmers and fishermen. He has others that had to do with taxes and things of this nature, and every one of them are things that somehow we can relate to today. Yeah. You may not be a farmer, and that's totally okay. I'm not a farmer either, but I grew up around it. I grew up, I have a huge garden. My family plants. You probably know people who have a garden. You like to plant things. You might have pots of things on your kitchen sill. You may have gone fishing at some point in your life. You understand the hard work of trying to catch something that doesn't want to be caught. Whatever that could be. Maybe a child or a deer or a dream. However that applies to you. It can be anything. But we can absolutely take the parables and completely apply them to the everyday life. And we all have to pay taxes. So that's still extremely applicable. And I love that that reveals what Hebrews 4.12 says, where it says the word of God is living and active because everything that Jesus said in the parables is completely applicable to today. 
So we're diving into one of my most favorite parables, because I got to pick it, is between the wise and the foolish builders. Now, I don't know about you, but my brain instantly goes in the wise and foolish builders to the story of the three little pigs. I mean, you got wise, medium, and just plain foolish. And it's a great depiction very quickly of what the wise and foolish builders look like. One, wisdom and a wise builder, it takes time. That brick house didn't go up in two minutes. It takes time. It takes diligence. He probably stubbed a few fingers along the way, but he had the better house when it was done. We're going to talk about wise and foolish. Now, the parable of the wise and foolish builders is only actually found in two of the Gospels, two accounts of the Gospels. And the two that have it are Matthew and Luke. Now, because I'm a facts person, I find this extremely fascinating that the two disciples that we know have the jobs of a tax collector and a doctor, the two occupations, the two professions that had to be extremely detail-oriented, grabbed a hold of this parable. And they put it in their account. And their accounts are quite similar. And I wanted to show you this. I pulled the, two, the first two verses from each. Matthew 7, 24, listen to this. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And Luke 6, 46 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. And he goes on in the very next verse to describe the wise builder. They both come with this very clear explanation of what wisdom looks like and what foolishness looks like. And they both open with this very same thing where Jesus says, if you are wise, I will show you what this looks like. And if you are foolish, I will show you exactly what this looks like. So let's take a look at this story overall. Jesus says in the passage, and I'm going to read Matthew 7. It's Matthew 7, 24. And it's not long, but I'm going to read this Matthew's version. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This story and this parable has been told time and time and time again based just from the perspective of the value of a good foundation. And we're going to talk about that for sure. But I also want to take into the perspective the attitude of obedience that goes into building that foundation. So the first point I want to make today is there is a difference between hearing and listening. Now, if you've been married for any period of time, I'm not going to pick on my husband. We'll wait till marriage night a little bit for that. But if you've been married for any period of time, you have children, or um, you've been around any human beings for more than five minutes of your life, you know that there is a difference between hearing and listening. Look, if I, had, if I had a nickel for every time my two children said the phrase, I didn't hear you, we could all be flying first class to Hawaii and back today without any problems. I'm just telling you. They heard me. They chose not to listen to me. Two different things. You all know exactly what I'm talking I can see you all. You're all like, yep, yep, I got somebody in my mind. They're sitting beside me. They're in the back. It's this person at work that keeps at you, whoever. But here's the thing. The way listening and hearing works is that Jesus says, if you've, if you've heard me, then you need to listen to me. So the object, the excuse of, I didn't know, immediately is eliminated by the first two verses in these passages because Jesus says, if you've heard me, now you got to listen to me. And listen is, listening is the opportunity, is the verb of action in the process. So if I hear God's word, then i got to do something with God's word. So here's the thing. Here's what happens is that sometimes we hear God's word. We know what's supposed to happen. We've grown up reading the word. We've gone to church. We've listened to, listened to different sermons. And that's all, you know, Sunday's great. We're going to use that as a picture. Monday's the best day because you're, you're still, you still remember everything that happened Sunday. And by Tuesday, there's a little more time in between the two. And sometimes we start to lose the application because we heard it but we didn't listen to it and we didn't get it applied into our everyday. So it fades off because listening must lead to application. So using my kids as an example, 
because it's just an easy example to give you, right? Whether you were a kid, because you were, or you have kids or grandkids, you know exactly how this works. If I say to my children, here are your shoes, would you please go put them in the mudroom? They heard me. Listening is what? Now they have to get up, come, and action takes place, right? The application is pick up the shoes and take them to the mudroom. This is all a very hopeful process. Let's just not lie about this. It's all very hopeful. And it does happen a good part of the time. But here's the thing is that we do that very thing to God all the time. We're like, I heard you. That was great. I got it. And we get over here. The storm comes. What am I supposed to do? And we all do it. I'm not picking on anyone. We all do it. I've been there. Absolutely. It's in Matthew 7, 12, where he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Have you ever seen Show America's Funny Some Videos? Yes. Yeah. Right? You could go to the original, like, VHS version with Bob Saget or the current version with Alfonso, like Carlton, doing his thing. Right, you know what I'm talking about? I can't do the Carlton. My husband can do the Carlton. I totally sold him out, but he could do the Carlton. Anyway, we watch this at home from time to time. And one of my favorite things about watching this with my kids is the, is the moment the clips, where the clip just starts. It's just begun. Nothing's even happened yet. And your kids or, or my husband or, or myself, inevitably one of us is like, oh, because you can see what's coming. You see the fall, the hit, the slip. You see it before the clip even started. You're like, oh, I can see it. You can see it coming. You see what's happening. See, so many times in our life, God sees it that way. He sees what's coming. He sees what's going to happen. He sees how it's coming. And a lot of times in our minds, we see it in this one thing, like, all right, I can handle that. That's fine. I got that. And, and then the next thing we know is it usually comes in threes, right? You've heard that old phrase or, or things happen in the storm and we have these moments. And then before we know it, we've taken it all on our shoulders because we're doing a lot more hearing than listening. And the weight of what we're doing is more than we can handle because we're not listening. So we're not applying. So we're not letting God carry the weight. We're trying to carry the weight. And before we know it, we're getting lower and lower and lower. And this happens a lot. And God says, let me take it. Let me help you walk through this. Because the thing is, it's not always a full-fledged storm. And I don't know about you, and maybe you've been in a storm. I said it last week, you're either in one, there's one coming, or you're at the close of one. And I don't know about you if you've ever been in a storm, a physical one, I know you have. It's really hard to fix the foundation in the middle of the storm. When I was eight, we had this, this storm came and my, I remember my dad and my brother, they were sitting outside and they were watching the clouds start to swirl. Things were starting to happen. And they were getting concerned. And where we lived, it was really awkward for a tornado to come. So we lived kind of inside a valley in the mountain and, and it shouldn't have happened there. And so the concern of just this unexpected piece of weather coming, it came into play. And I guess there was, there was concern on my parents' account that they wouldn't find me. So my dad, when he built the garage, he built this pit into the garage and it was so he could change the oil in the car and not have to lay down. He could just walk down into the pit, car drives over it. And they took me to the pit. They opened the, the boards on it and put me in the pit and handed me a loaf of bread. That's all I got. I didn't get peanut butter. I didn't get butter. I didn't get water. I got a loaf of bread and put in the pit and told to stay. And this was so they could find me if they needed me. When you're in the storm, it's hard. I appreciate the protection. There was a lot going on. I kind of, I, I give them a hard time about it now. But anyway, but the reality is, had that tornado come, had a storm come, I was somewhere they knew I was safe, I was protected, and they could deal with the other things that they needed to deal with and not fear. It's very hard to fix something and correct something in the middle of the problem, in the middle of the storm. It can be done, it can be handled, it can be managed. It's not a wipe your eyes, well, I guess I wipe my hands, I just gotta wait till it's over and start over. If you're in the middle of the storm and you're feeling broken and crumbled, it can get fixed now. There's a correction that can come to your spiritual foundation now. It doesn't have to wait till the end, but you have to acknowledge it. Luke's account, he uses this phrase. He says, put it into practice. Put it into practice. Excuse me, let me debunk an old Christian myth right off the bat. We are not called to be perfect. 
We're not called to be perfect. We're not called to look perfect. We're not called to, to do everything perfect. We're not called to present everything perfect. We're not called to be perfect. That was Jesus's job and he did it really well. And I'm not out to try and take his job and I don't think you are either. And so Jesus did the perfect thing. We are called to love everyone the way Jesus loves them. We are called to present the gospel and the faithfulness and the goodness in the presence of the Holy Spirit the way God spoke it and the way God wrote it. That's our job. And our job is to, to follow through and do what God's called us to do and operate in that fashion, right? So here's what happens. Sometimes we get to this place where we let our feelings and our emotions dictate a lot of how we handle circumstances, situations, and storms. And those are called reactions. Reactions are emotion-based, they're quick, they're knee-jerk reactions, they're rough, and most of the time we have to say we're sorry for them after we did them. That's how reactions work. Responses are a spiritual maturity that are full-fledged, they're strong, and they're founded. They're not easy, they're intentional, they're usually slower, they're purpose-filled, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit but they're not always easier. So when we take listening and we take application, it equals a solid foundation. Now I'm not a mathematician, we've all been over that. I'm not even gonna pretend, but this is an equation that I know goes without question is accurate. When we take listening to God's word and we, we add it to application and we put it into practice, it will equal a solid foundation. Here's the cool thing about the solid foundation. If we continue to do this, it never stops growing. That foundation gets more and more solid, more and more firm, more and more put into practice. So the storms are going to come. And I want to show you something about a storm. Now, I have my cool little illustrations up here because I like illustrations. I hope you do too. Because I was a children's pastor for 11 years. This is how I know to do things. But the thing about a storm is that it doesn't always look like a hurricane. I think something for me, and I'm going to share something with you in a moment, but I think something for me is that I feel like any storm that's a spiritual storm has to look like a hurricane. But the problem is, if my spiritual foundation is more like the sand, the slightest inconvenience can wreck everything. So if I take this water and I do a slight inconvenience, you know what that might be, I don't know, but even the slightest inconvenience is going to adjust what this foundation, I get to make a mess today, is going to adjust what this foundation will do, right? You can see already like the sand is coming apart over here. If you can see it, it can turn it a little bit. Like it's already starting to run. That's a small inconvenience, whatever that may be for you. I don't know what that is in your day or your job or life, but when the smallest inconvenience starts creating this kind of adjustment, we need to work on our foundation. We have to recognize it. So let me tell you this point one, it's not in the notes in a sense, but point one, recognizing that this is our response to an inconvenience is spiritual maturity. So when we can recognize, hey, I'm off. This isn't going the way I should be. I'm overreacting. It's not everybody else's fault. This is me. I've got to deal with this. Then this is starting to lead to building this. But when we're sitting here in the small inconvenience going, it's his fault. He said it this way. She shouldn't talk to me that way. I don't like how they say this. This is too much. I can't handle this. X, Y, and Z has happened. And it becomes everybody else's problem why I'm struggling through this. We're still here. Spiritual maturity comes from recognizing the adjustment from needing to go from here to here. And that's big. That's a huge thing. The storms are going to come. They're going to come in a lot of ways. Sometimes they come in a minor inconvenience, and sometimes they come in a hurricane. It's what you do in the hurricane. It's what you do in the inconvenience. But it's also how you prepared for it. Now, you all know in 2016, right, my husband, he experienced the first pulmonary embolism. That's all been shared multiple times. Let me give you a little bit of the picture around that season that I don't know that's ever been shared. In November of 2016, that year, I was in a car accident that caused us to have to get the rental car that caused his first blood clot. We've worked through that one. Dealt with the blood clot on December 16th. His dad passed away on January 1st. My grandfather passed away on January 27th. My mom had been diagnosed with cancer earlier in that year. She went through chemo, and then right after January 27th, my mom had a surgery that went wrong, she went home and had to go back into the hospital for a second surgery, and we weren't sure how that was all gonna come out. That was a seven-week time span 
from the first event to the last event. Seven weeks. That was a lot. Oh, and Asher didn't have his first birthday yet. So itty bitty little person, and we moved. We bought a new house in that whole seven week time span. I share this with you because here's what I didn't do. I didn't quit. I wanted to quit. And let me tell you what that storm looked like. It was nasty. And the winds just stalled over my head. And I'm going to tell you right now that there were multiple times I curled up in a corner and I just flat cried because I didn't know what else to do and I didn't know where else to put my energy and I didn't know what else to do. And I didn't know, I didn't know what else to do. Like, I don't know how else to explain it. And then one day, somewhere in those seven weeks, this word from the Lord came into my heart. And I believe God wrote this down because somebody's in a storm today and you need to hear this word. And it was this, I couldn't quit because God was doing something and he was going to use this storm to reveal his glory as an opportunity to share who he was with somebody else, whether it was in the middle of this storm or 10 years from now. But because of that promise, I couldn't quit. And that was enough. And I'm going to tell you right now that I cried through that phrase in my mind for weeks, trying to figure out how to get through the next step and the next process and deal with whatever was coming next. I don't share that with you to say I have this perfect foundation or everything was perfect. Like I said, it was there were some ugly moments in there. But here's what I do want you to see. If I wouldn't have had the foundation that I had in the moment going into that, I would have crumbled. So the question is, when the storms come, and they're going to come, there's no umbrella that's going to keep the storms away. There's nothing that's, ah, there's nothing that's going to stop it. It's going to come. And that foundation, I did really good with the sand. That totally, that foundation, it's all going to come down. Plant slide. You get the point. You get the point. No, but truthfully, sometimes that's how life goes. Even sometimes we think we're still okay. We think we still got it together. But the reality is the foundation's a lot weaker and we know it. Nobody else, let, other people don't always see it. We know it. And that's why my husband says, that's why we believe, like, we've got to inspect what we expect. You've got to look at that foundation. You've got to check your foundation. And over here, this isn't going anywhere. I mean, my kids built these houses really good. This is not. Like, it's not going to go anywhere. That foundation is solid. It's firm. But here's the thing. Here's a couple, a couple thoughts. When you buy a house, you get an inspection done, right? And a part of that inspection is they check the structure of the house. They take a, a general look at the foundation. And then if you want a thorough look, you can get a person who specializes in foundations to come out and truly investigate the foundation and give you a picture. We need to do that in our lives all the time. So here's some of the things. Because like I said, your foundation can continue to grow. It doesn't, it's not one time, it can keep building. That's the beauty of spiritual maturity. So whether you've been saved for six months or 60 years or 20 years or 15 years or 45 years or 20 minutes, that foundation should ever be growing. It should ever constantly be worked at. So here's how this looks. We get to know God's voice and we trust his voice. We don't listen to doubt and we recognize when doubt comes in that that's not from the Lord. And I'm capable of saying, that's doubt. That's not from God. I'm not going to give it ear. I'm not going to give it time. I'm not going to give it energy. That builds spiritual maturity. The next thing that comes into that mix is being able to say, I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm going to be okay. Because I'm going to trust that God knows what's going to happen next. And even though I don't have all the answers, and it hurts, and my heart hurts, and I'm crying big tears because that's real life, and we're supposed to have emotion. We're not supposed to operate and make choices in emotion. We operate and make choices in the spirit. That's the difference between response and reaction. And God takes those moments, and he says, I'm going to show you that I got it. I'll take care of it. I'm going to hold your emotion and the situation at the same time. And the last one, or at least for the four bricks that I brought, is being able to say, God, I give you even, I give you what I don't know. I give you my emotion. I'm going to trust you in everything. And I can rest in that. That fourth thing is being able to rest in that. And there's more like you could, guys, you could build a whole Jenga board. that's never going anywhere in the foundation that comes in the presence of Lord. And I say this, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm not. Um, and, and a lot of you, we know the parable 
But here's the thing. You have to do that same evaluation on your foundation in your own life. You have to do that same evaluation in your foundation in your own life. And you can do that a couple of ways. You can ask yourself some questions. Am I listening to God's word or am I only hearing it? Am I applying God's word to my everyday? Am I taking what I'm hearing from God's word? Am I, am I listening to it? Am I molding it over? Am I, am I marinating it in my spirit? Am I thinking about it? And then am I, is it coming to the forefront of my mind when something's happening and am I choosing to do something with it? That's the biggest thing. Am I choosing to do something with it? Am I choosing to let it work in my life? And do I trust him to handle all the big things? Do I trust him to handle the big things? These questions are a big part of what we do and how we adjust and, and assess and inspect our personal spiritual foundation. Because like I said, storms are coming. They come small, they come big, they come unexpected. Sometimes you can see them coming, like, like the great America's Funniest Home Videos. But the truth of the matter is, God sees every one of them. He knows exactly how they're coming. He knows how the enemy wants to use them. And you know what's even better? God knows how he's going to use them for his glory. It's what we do in them that either allows him to do that to the fullest potential, or sometimes we curl up and say, I quit. God says, don't quit, because I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. Wow, it is always a joy to be able to worship Jesus and hear from his word with you. If you want to sow a seed into Clearview Church's ministry, into what we're doing in the greater Cleveland area, in the nation, around the world, you can do that by going online to clearviewchurch.net slash giving, and you can go ahead and give your tithes and offerings, give to missions, or give to kingdom builders as we advance the gospel and build the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. I pray you have an incredible week, and we look forward to joining you again online at our next online service.